So imagine you're in a room full of people and they're chanting a series of syllables in some unknown language. And if you ask them what it means, they tell you it doesn't have any meaning. It's just sound. What would you do? Well, if you're like me, you would try and find out what it actually means. Uh, about 10 years ago, I was taking a course in meditation at the Zen Center. It actually lasted for about a year. It was like a workshop. And uh, so I spent a fair amount of time there and participated in some of their services. Uh, this is their courtyard. Uh, Zen, if you don't know, uh, has an archetypal figure called the Bodhisattva. It's a person who is so selfless that they refuse nirvana until everyone else is enlightened. And that's kind of a role model in, in Zen. It's, it's not really someone you pray to like you might in, in other religions. Um, so it's, it's not bad. There, there are forms of Buddhism that are more devotional, where you have a personal God that you pray to and develop feelings for, but they don't really talk about that so much in Zen. Uh, the, Zen, the signature practice of Zen, of course, is meditation. You just sit quietly and watch your breathing, and if something comes up in your mind, you watch that happen, and then you watch it go away, and that's pretty much it. So there's, there isn't prayer, but there is a lot of chanting. And uh, there's a, uh, a couple of different kinds of chants, and Zen has a, Buddhism has a long history that goes back about 200 years, and uh, as it made its way from India through China to Japan, it picked up various scriptures in various languages, and, and uh, Zen, uh, Soto Zen at the Zen Center is pretty traditionalist. So they've got sutras in various languages, and they've got things called dharanis, which are like mantras, and basically that's the category thing, which is just pure sound. Uh, it's not translated. Uh, Sanskrit, as you may know, is a, uh, <laughs> a language of Asian <laughs> India, uh, which uh, it has a lot of consonants and a lot of consonant clusters. It's really, it's all about the consonants in, in Sanskrit. There's pretty simple vowels, it's phonetically written. Uh, and that's one of the languages. Uh, Chinese, uh, uh, often more familiar with, it's really all about the vowels. There are not as many uh, consonants, and there's lots of vowel combinations and clusters, and there's also tones. <coughs> so it's, it's really a, a very vowel intensive language. So very different from Sanskrit. And Japanese is the simplest of all. There's really just uh, 50 total unique syllables in Japanese. That's because there's just five vowels and a handful of, of consonants. Uh, it's not related to Chinese, although it uses Chinese writing. And it uses its own phonetic system. So some chants. Uh, here is an example chant: Buddham Saranam Gacchami. This is how it starts out, and it's in Sanskrit, and it's a, a pretty universal Buddhist uh, chant. It's not specific to Zen, but it's one chant that I heard at Zen Center. Here's another one: the rope chant, which starts out something like Dai Sai Gadamuku. They like to the chant in a really low monotone. Um, and it was really Chinese, but it's pronounced through a Japanese filter because it has a Japanese uh, different phonetic system. Here's another one which starts out in Chinese, but halfway through merges into Sanskrit, which has been transliterated. So it's not translated, it's just pronounced the best way you can if you're a Chinese person trying to pronounce Sanskrit. Um, so it gets a little bit complicated. And this, fi this final one, this one is the, uh, the mystery chant. It's called the Dai Shin Tarani, or the Mantra of Great Compassion. And People are chanting it, and some of the words kind of look like Japanese, but um, they told me it didn't have any meaning to it. But I was uh, a little bit skeptical because I know some Sanskrit, and some of the syllables sound a lot like the word for great compassion in Sanskrit, which I thought was probably not a coincidence. So I Googled it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I didn't oh, find a wiki page, which was disappointing, uh, because if anything exists, it has a wiki page. Uh, and, but I did find a, a Japanese scripture manual which said that, well, we don't really know where the Dharanis come from, so uh, we don't translate them. I was like, okay. Uh, but I Googled again and on, on the transliterated text, and I found something called the Nila, Nila Kancha Dharani, which is, uh, says is also known as the Great Compassion Dharani. I was like, great, but what is this weird name? Uh, it turns out that this, uh, well, they, they reconstructed the, uh, using these manuscripts that were more than a thousand years old, found in China, uh, bilingual manuscripts, they reconstructed the Sanskrit text, and, and here it is, and you can see, if you kind of squint, that you can kind of go from the left-hand side to the right-hand side, and this is the translation. And so it turns out that basically it was originally a kind of hymn to Avalokiteshvara. Uh, it was actually a, a hymn with Avalokiteshvara pronouncing the names of a Hindu god. It was a chant about a chant. Uh, <laughs> and in fact, it was originally founded in a, or it, it, its origin was in a devotional context. But over the centuries and the millennia, as it went from India to China to Japan, it lost its meaning and it lost its devotional.
devotional context, but the sound was preserved. And that's what we have today. And that's it. <laughs> as much as possible. As much as possible. <laughs> That's cool. That was my thing. Yes? Do you think there's something particular to Sanskrit that lends itself to this tradition or these traditions, whether it's like the way your mouth is shaping the words or the way it looks on cover? Hey, that's a good question. Uh, part of the reason why these things have been preserved in as best as they can the original sound that's been preserved is that the uh, the Indian tradition of, of thinking of sound as being this fundamental thing. And so the really famous mantra Om is explained as being something which encapsulates all sounds because it starts, it actually, it's not O, and if you're being precise, it's A, uh, it's a schwa, it's A, uh, U, mm. And so it moves from sort of the articulation point moves from like the back of the throat to the lips. So that encompasses the entire range of sounds that humans can make. And so it's this, like, the, yeah. So they, they took sound very seriously. And that's why they developed these mantras, which you can look at philosophically as being <coughs> sort of symbolic of the unification of, of all things. Or you can think of them in sort of the more common sense of like magical spells, which is probably the way that most people have thought about them over time. Yes. As learning the translation of the meaning, literal meaning of that particular uh, meditation affected your interaction with it? So I don't go there on a regular basis anymore, but when I was going there, I found it really strange. Because like I said, it's, Zen is not a devotional form of religion. And so to, to be aware that this chant is really singing the praises of a deity was just very strange. And, and I actually even asked the head of the the city center at the time, a guy named Paul Haller, I asked him about it, and he said, oh no, it doesn't have any meaning, it's just sound. <laughs> I said, I said, actually, I <laughs> <laughs> uh, But yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a traditionalist place, so, so they're, they're happy with their interpretation of it, and it's considered like a meditation, so that they don't think about the meaning, they just kind of feel the sounds and listen to the sounds, and, and that's, that's the practice. Once you discovered that there was meaning behind this one particular one that you heard, and there was a whole category of these chants, did you look at the meaning of any of the other ones? So that w that's, I mean, there are only a few that are really chanted like every day, and this is, this is one of them, and it, it's also the longest one that doesn't have any obvious meaning. Um, the, the one that I showed that was half red and half black, that one, you can think of those transliterated parts as, as actually mantras, um, and uh, if you actually can go back to that slide, it's about halfway through. Back, back, that one. So that busa moko sa moko hoja horomi. So moko sa is mahasattva, and moko hoja horomi is mahaprajna paramita. And so those are effectively like mantras, although they're they're also Sanskrit words. Um, but um, what they've done in the in the and center context is they've just given you the Sanskrit original. So, so in other words, they, they, they basically, they're aware that, that these sounds corresponded to a mantra in the past, and so they've just given you the, what they know. And they've only done it for these very specific cases. Um, so there aren't, this is the one that really kind of stuck, it, stuck out as a big mystery that I had to solve. Yes? So the way that I understand mantras today, contextually, is and like a thing that you use to give yourself really specific reassurance, maybe, or something like that. But it seems like the way that you're using mantra here has like almost no context. It's more just like a meditative like absence of definitiveness. Is that how did you aware of how that changed, or are they actually using it for that reason, or how does this fit into their daily? It's, it's hard to give a single answer because of the 2,500 plus history, because actually it's, you know, Buddhism arose in this Hindu context and Hinduism had already been around for thousands of years. Right. So they, they've been used, like I said, it's like some people thought of them more philosophically, some people thought of them literally as magical spells. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it really just kind of depends on where geographically and at what time in history and what type of people you're talking to. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
but I, I think all of those are, are valid interpretations. What's, what's the process for learning these things? As a new monk, like you go, you go to a new monastery, do they give you a text to read, or do you just have, just, just follow along, and you're like, you're, you're, for the first few, like, you're like, oh shit. <laughs> yeah, uh, so I, I can't talk about traditional Zen monasteries so much. At the, at the Zen Center in San Francisco, they're all just printed out in uh, Romanized uh, versions. Uh, and the, the particular, the, the mystery chant, the Daiki Shintani, would be presented um, as Chinese characters with the Japanese phonetic alphabet uh, underneath as a gloss. Um, and, and that's, that's actually pretty, that's probably the, the most common way that it would be in a Japanese context because they, they think of China as the, the, the it, it is the, the source of writing and the source of, of Buddhism um, you know, after, after India. And so they, they want to sort of present things kind of like in this authentic way. And so, so that's typically the way we present it. But, but um, yeah, unless, unless you're trained, you wouldn't know how to pronounce those Chinese characters correctly. So this is chanted rarely. What's the context that you're chanting it in? What's the kind of the cue for this is the time for this one? Yeah, so I'm actually having trouble remembering because it's been a few years since I've been, but there's a few different places where you do chants and so like there's a morning meditation where everybody all the people who are living there or anybody else who wants to, to join can just go to the meditation hall. Uh, and it's mostly meditation, but then right at the end they'll do a series of chants. So that might be one case. There's also like weekly services where they do a variety of different chants. Um, so I'm not sure of it. I, I, just don't I think I, I feel like I heard it in the meditation hall, which means probably between one of the periods of meditation. There's sort of a cognitive phenomenon that uh, people say they do their best thinking in the shower because they're actually engaged in a task, but otherwise not doing anything with their brain. I was just wanted to try that out on you. Is that is that maybe one of the functions of having a mantra rather than just sitting uh, to give you something to do so that your mind can wander in a different way? Does, that, does that feel right? <laughs> I buy it, yeah. Um, I mean, the another thing that I've done there is, is I've done like a, a seven-day silent retreat. And basically, that, the way that's structured is that most of the day you're meditating, but when you're not meditating, you're doing a, a very programmed series of activities so that you don't have to think about what you're doing. and. In particular, the, the meals are done in this formal, what's called oryoki style, which is it's, it comes from Zen monasteries. And the way it works is basically you've got a bowl and a napkin and chopsticks and maybe a couple of, like a spoon. And basically, you keep it there by your cushion uh, when you're meditating. But when the meal time comes, you, you basically like go through the series of ritualized motions where you take it out, you put it in front of you, and then like the servers come around with dishes full of stuff and serve you and then you the, the whole process of like unwrapping like your napkin is wrapped around the bowl so untying it like the it, like placing it on your lap the whole taking everything out it's all prescribed so you know exactly like what like every little motion is like a little dance and, and at first of course it's totally the opposite of, of meditative because you're like i want to do it the right way <laughs> but once you do learn it then it literally becomes just like i don't have to think about anything i'm just doing this very complicated or intricate series of quite beautiful uh, motions without having to think about anything so yeah that's, that's very much they probably wouldn't talk about it in terms of generating creative I I ideas it's more like just actually not having to think about anything but Thank you, Kenji. Thank you. Thank you.